Hey, welcome back to the Out of Spec Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan, joined by Marcus, uh, who is from Energy Pal and is a somewhat of a solar expert, at least that's what I'll call him. And um, that's that's the topic of today's show is solar energy, photovoltaic panels, things of that nature, because we haven't really talked a whole lot about solar, which is somewhat ironic because it tends to go hand in hand with people's thoughts around EVs and electrification, largely because of the sustainable nature of the energy. So there's a lot of topics we can cover with solar, and I'm hoping to do more and more on this podcast as we continue to branch out, bring more knowledge and awareness to different topics. Um, but today, Marcus, I wanted to just pick your brain on some solar things in general, but especially just how it is with working with energy companies, You know, maybe some of the benefits and downsides of solar and the complexities that go hand in hand with maybe someone installing it and trying to work with energy. Because it's not as simple as you throw panels on your roof and then suddenly your energy is free, right? So <laughs> what? where do we even start with this? Yeah, yeah well, th first of all, thanks, Jordan, for having me on the on the show. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know, it is it is a very common topic of conversation um, here at Energy Pal with our energy advisors and homeowners who are looking into solar specifically because they put an order in or they're getting an EV. And that sparks the thought of, hey, should I look into solar? And then they fill up something online or maybe they, you know, go try to Google, should I get solar panels? And then they get hit with either absolutely nothing, right? Because they're probably in an area where their utility company isn't, or they're in a, you know, in a zip code where their utility company doesn't offer any great sort of buyback or net metering types of rate structures or any sort of special tariffs for distributed energy. Um, or they're in an area like, you know, Southern California or, or someplace in Arizona, and they just get inundated um, with requests. And a big part of the conversation of solar is understanding how much energy are you using and how much uh, and how does your utility relate with that energy, right? Um, it's super, you know, it's, it's an important part of the discovery process on whether or not solar even makes sense. And you know, there's like three, 4,000 utility companies in the United States. And oh, wow. there's, so there, and each one of them has a different rule. Some yeah. states have legislation that requires you to have a sort of the utility company to implement some sort of credit system for mm -hmm. power fed back to the grid. Um, but maybe let me back up. So typically when people are looking into solar, they're thinking of two things. One is like, let me get solar panels and slap them on my RV, connect it into my cottage, and I'm going to go off grid, right? Yeah. And that's a pretty common, um, maybe less common now, but pretty common idea. Um, that's not really what we do at all. That's what that's actually not much what most people do when it comes to solar. They do a grid tied system and they can value essentially the solar investment through the savings that they generate off their power bill. Yeah. So the question is just how do you calculate that savings, right? Um, yeah. So there's a couple of different structures that utility companies will do. And this is a part of, you know, what we do with people is identify A, what the utility company is and B, what that rate, how that utility company interacts with solar, however they decide to pay for solar panels. Um, but they typically fall into a couple of categories. So yeah. maybe I can kind of explain that. So this, 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 the best one for solar, which is in about maybe like 10 states, Mm -hmm. approximately that it has like a, this sort of mandate like California's the Connecticut's the Massachusetts the basically the states where the utility cost is so high that you know I guess the state government is sort of forcing some sort of net metering kind of standard um, this is a, essentially net metering um, it's a place where the power from the solar panels will feed your home you'll self-consume all of that energy during the day instantaneously and then any excess power that you don't need during the day gets fed back to the grid and the grid forms essentially like a battery bank where you store credits on your bill. So it's like a yeah. billing mechanism, right? Store credits on your bill. And then later in that evening, you'll, you'll sort of burn through those credits at night. Gotcha. Um, and without any need for a actual physical energy storage or battery system on your house. So you're, you're seasonally and daily storing energy. So in May, June, July, typically, people are building up a big credit balance. They look at their utility account. They have a bunch of negative you know, amounts on it. And then in the winter, when the sun, you know, the, the hours of sunlight drops, the solar panels produce less energy, you pull from that. Um, and that's, that's a fantastic program. Um, it's typically locked in for 15 to 20 years for a homeowner for that power meter. And it gives people the peace of mind to make the investment. Um, 
And would you say that's probably the most common installation type? Because some people think solar means you also have to have batteries and store it, local storage on your home. Obviously, that's not the case. Is, is this probably one of the most common types because it's more cost efficient than having batteries? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. So, you know, I started in solar 2010, 20, you know, and mm -hmm. at that time, batteries didn't make sense at all. There was yeah. no room for a battery at all. The way it was just it's too early, you know? Yeah. Um, now that's changed, I'm happy to say, and we do a lot of batteries, probably 30% of our projects have batteries attached to them, but mm -hmm. they wouldn't be enough. Like batteries are great, but how do you store your summer production and mm -hmm. use it in the winter? Yeah. That's more right? day to day. Where, rather where are you going to, where are you going to put that energy? You know, the, the bucket, <laughs> the bucket of the battery is too small. It can't, it's not going to mm -hmm. store thousands of kilowatt hours that you then can pull because your heat pump is running during the summertime or you're charging your car in the, in the wintertime. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's definitely much more common to have what we call grid tied solar. Mm -hmm. um, that is, that is the main without a battery um, system sort of in place. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the main, that's the easy one. So if you're in one of those markets, you know, one way to find out if you're a homeowner, you know, you look on, you can go to your utility company website, search in net metering and see if they have anything related to net metering. Um, but it still could be tricky because they can call it net metering, but really what happens is, Instead of that, you know, normally it's a one-for-one -one exchange or an yeah. ideal situation. It's a one-for-one -one exchange, um, which is a great incentive for getting solar. But a lot of utilities will do some sort of partial exchange. Mm. Or if you produce more than you need on a billing cycle, so in one month, let's say they charge you 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Maybe if you're feeding power back more than you need that month, so it's May and you're producing more energy than you needed, they'll give you not 20 cents times whatever, 1,000 kilowatt hours of excess, they'll give you like 10 cents okay. or maybe three cents or seven cents. So there's various different buyback rates that different yeah. companies will have and that will affect the economics. So part of our role is to take that knowledge of how they handle it and factor that into the calculations to come mm -hmm. up with an estimation of, okay, you go solar, you'll save this much. Do you see that typically company by company or is it more of a state? Like are there certain states that are just not, really giving people the full amount of what they would expect the credit to be, or is it like very company specific? You know, I would, I would actually, um, it's typically the investor owned utilities. So the mm -hmm. utilities that are owned by an investor, they're usually regulated by some state body and that state body will might have a, a program that says you need to enforce some sort of positive net metering because yeah. otherwise if you were investor owned utility, why would you give away free credits to solar customers who are only paying you $10 a month? Yeah. Right. Like you probably wouldn't do that if you were a utility company executive, unless you just wanted to give away money to solar people. Right. Yeah. So they're typically forced to do so. So those pro interesting, it's like interestingly related. Really, you would expect the investor owned utilities to have the worst programs, but they typically have the best programs. Really? Okay. And then it's the municipal. So like the city of Sacramento or mm -hmm. LED, Los Angeles, or, you know, some other sort of municipal city that owns the electrical grid um, and also manages the billing and, and power distribution to homeowners. They have usually okay kind of buyback plans where it's not amazing, but it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. um, and then these small regional co-ops, like a, a township of like a farm in Ohio or something, um, like a, a farming town in Ohio, it's usually like a co-op owned utility. Mm -hmm. And those ones usually have the worst. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. Wow. So yeah. What, so, what other... Simple answer is it depends. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. What other complexities are there with working with utilities? I mean, do you, do you work with a lot of customers specifically and utilities or is it kind of the customer works with their utilities? You work with the customer and there's kind of a sort of a sort of triangle approach. Yeah. So, you know, maybe just kind of, we should back up and talk about how we operate. So, you know, energy pal, what we do in the industry, we're, we're a platform for homeowners to access multiple installer options mm -hmm. and get solar installed. Right. So gotcha. what we do is we work, we have partnerships with the deep partnerships with a lot of great installers and in a lot of great markets. We're in like 27 different states and a bunch of utilities. Um, and what we do for homeowners is we give them more choice. Right. They can kind of cross compare options more effectively because they are talking to one person who can translate mm -hmm. the different panels, inverters, designs, installer workmanship warranties and everything and utility rates and translate that more effectively. They get um the homeowner would get a better kind of customer experience, less like pressure sales tactics, because we yeah. just have more options. We can just, we can just talk with people as like 
like your pal, right? That's, that's yeah. why it's called energy pal. <laughs> just be like a pal. It's like, let's figure it out and come up with a plan that works. And maybe it doesn't work for people and that's okay. Um, so that's kind of a service we provide for the homeowner. We also help them essentially as a form of like escalations for their project to make sure things actually happen, right? So there's a bunch of stages in a solar project. It needs to, there needs to be like a survey of the house. We need to come up with a plan set of drawing. We need to submit that to the, the city. You know, we need to get that permit received, maybe some interconnection approvals because we're building a power plant on someone's house, yeah. right? So we're not just doing a construction. So you got to do all the construction stuff that's needed for a home renovation, plus all the utility you know, approval stuff, right? Yeah. Utility needs to know how much power is being connected to that transformer nearby. Yeah. And so it's a much more complex pro like project type than like a bathroom renovation or something. So we essentially support the homeowner or our customers with that process to make sure it happens quickly, it happens smoothly, and nobody drops the ball because there's a ton of different people involved. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of rigmarole to get through that process. And, you know, I've been involved in different home renovations, but also they can be annoying in their own way, especially depending on the state or city you live in because of various codes that have to be compliant with. But yeah, it adds a whole layer of complexity. Um, would you say kind of those codes, like, are there kind of like restrictions that are huge hurdles for this to be even an option for people? Um, like we, we, we talk a lot about, you know, electric car infrastructure and sometimes where you think would make the most sense to be a charger or like, why would you not have home charging? It, there's random hurdles that people just see and stress out about and therefore don't tackle it. There's obviously a way through almost anything, but do you see like these codes well, with, and issues? With enough money, there's usually a way, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but that said, money is a constraint. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Probably the biggest constraint is, you know, we're typically installing solar panels on someone's roof, right? There's a mm -hmm. pre-existing structure. So yeah. the biggest, the two main issues for people that run and that start a solar project is they think the roof's in good condition and it's actually not because mm -hmm. right? you're not a roofer and you don't get up on roofs often. You're like, yeah, my roof's fine. Turns out it's, you know, it's already degrading to a point where we've, if we start, you know, penetrating and flashing and making sure everything's watertight, you're still going to have a leaky roof because your roof is going to leak anyway. So yeah. that typically will spark a, a sort of a re-roofing requirement, which maybe was planned for, maybe wasn't planned for, and then ultimately could, you know, be a, you know, kind of an economic roadblock. Mm. Um, the other issue is people's main panels, right? So we have to tie the solar system, connect electrically through conduit to yeah. their main electrical panel. Sometimes people's panels are too old. There's a specific national electric code requirements of the bus bar size and the, and the amp amperage of a main panel and the yep. solar power. And you can't have too many, like, you know, you're getting power from the grid and you're getting power from the solar. And if your main panel can't handle that much potential energy, then it's not going to be approved, right? Yeah. You're not going to get it inspected. It's not going to get permitted. So a lot of times people have to upgrade their main panels to a higher amp um, main panel or something like that. There's a bunch of different solutions we have for that. Yeah, which can be beneficial, obviously, f or in some cases required for the solar. But then also that could have a beneficial trickle down effect to installing like a level two charger in your garage. Absolutely, absolutely. We, yeah, no, we, we we've it. done. <laughs> we probably attach EV charging, and typically a lot of our not every installer we work with will do it, but a lot of them were very comfortable in adding in an EV charger into the process of getting the solar installed, mm -hmm. so that we can you know upgrade someone's panel, get them an electric charger add a battery to their you know system plus the solar all wrapped into one you know payment that's like 30 percent cheaper than what they're paying now for power yeah you know so what, what do you see as a way you know obviously there's a lot of hurdles a lot of it can be financial what is a way to get more people into solar because like, like you said the financial it typically is the biggest component obviously there's ways to sort of finance it over the life of the solar and you know, having the bill credits and stuff is an easy way to say, kind of like an electric car. It's like, well, you'll save money on gas. It's hard to realize those savings up front. Right. And what we've seen a lot of is government incentives, tax credits, stuff like that. Do you see a lot of variation in how utilities companies or even governments um, like almost like stipend people to get these or what's, what's a solution to get more of them in the market? Yeah. So uh, that brings up just the topic of incentives, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, the primary incentives that like your your viewership's mostly U.S. right? Not Canadian. Um, pretty pretty varied, but I think majority U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the in in the United States, there's a federal tax credit 
for solar. And what's great is it's not capped. Um, so if you have a hundred thousand dollar solar system, you'll get thirty thousand dollars as a federal income tax credit. Um, it doesn't. It's not a, like a rebate, so you won't get that if you don't have any tax liability. So it opens up some challenges mm. for people who can actually get it. Um, but it's a massive incentive, and that's federal. Yeah. But a lot of little, a lot of states will have other than if you include net metering as an incentive, because it is right. It's a yeah. program that people can get into. Um, there's actually other financial incentives that are more upfront. Um, some markets. They, this used to be a lot bigger a couple of years ago when the price of solar was much more expensive. Um, but there's still a couple of pockets where you can get upfront rebates. So, like in New York, if you lived in upstate New York, you could get uh, like a you know a certain rebate per watt or kind of per panel, if you will, um, at upfront to reduce your cost of the system. If you lived in Illinois um, and you were with one of, you could actually get like a pretty massive, almost thirty to forty percent check back from from your utility funded by the state, essentially funded by all the other ratepayers. So everyone's paying for these programs, but the money funnels up and then, you know, gets lost a little bit and some comes back to people who go solar. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's definitely some great incentives that are upfront. What I'm noticing uh, in the industry now is there's a lot more incentives increasingly for battery storage mm -hmm. and grids who are saying, hey, if you get a battery and we can just use your battery, which is probably sitting in your garage doing nothing most of the time, right? Yeah. Because the United States power grid is like 99.99% .99 uptime. It's almost always up. But when it's down, yeah. it's really emotionally painful and people get a battery, they invest in generators. It's frustrating, right? Your whole business falls apart and it's like the end of the world. Um, but it's all it's up most of the time, right? Yeah. So the what a lot of utilities now on the East Coast and California and Nevada are doing is they're saying, hey, if you install a battery with your solar panels, then we can discharge your battery during the peak in the summer and we'll pay you money gotcha. for that. Yeah. So that's something that's starting to come up more and more. And that makes a lot of sense for the utility model because they can kind of participate in this. It's not, hey, you solar customer, you're kind of against me and I'm losing value by you not paying me a rate, you know, because, and, and I'm just having to give you these credits because the government's telling me. Now it's like, hey, you solar and battery homeowner, help me manage the grid better and yeah. like let's all share in the rewards it's actually really like you know it gets me it gets me excited about the future state of maybe some <laughs> utopia where we're all sharing power and it's you know it's like microgrids and every the community works together it's a it's a cool idea um, yeah. but we're actually working we're like fundamentally rechanging the infrastructure to make that a reality which is pretty yeah. cool and you can, uh, you guys have probably covered that with EV and vehicle to grid a little bit, or, or thought about bit. it at least. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there's, there's so many, you know, topics in this realm to to, to discuss uh, as yeah. far as grid structure and the benefits of people having EVs. You know, basically local storage, whether it's EV or a solid battery at the house. Um, so yeah, there's there's so many topics to cover. I kind of wanted to. This is a good introductory kind of episode of just some of the. Challenges, unique hurdles, the the way utilities companies are interacting because people don't always think about that. I mean, I, I think it'd be fairly obvious, but typically people, at least I've come across people who are, oh yeah, I just buy solar panels and put them on, probably just hire some random person and then I just suddenly have power. But it's more complex than that. And yeah, I definitely wouldn't buy like a kit of solar panels <laughs> without having have done some sort of analysis of the payback. And yeah. the interconnection requirements, or working with a group like us who just packages all that together um, in a pretty seamless process for people. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it's it's less um, simple than some people think, but also more attainable than the those who think it's simple and then do some research and freak out. Don't freak out. It's still doable. Yeah. And I think there's there's a lot of other circumstances to look at to maybe in future podcasts because there's so much to know and so much uh you know with the idea with these podcasts with electric cars but also just clean energy in general is to get more info to the general public because there's so much to know and the more people know the less uh it's stressful weird info hanging in the air i think what's challenging too is it's so conditional right on where you mm -hmm. live and what that program looks like and you know your house itself right how much tree cover do you have actually so I think that's part of the challenge too, uh, with yeah. even just this format. And and so what we've tried to build as Energy Pal is we want to cover the entire every market right now. We're in if we can get on someone paying cash, mm -hmm. if we can get them better than a ten year payback on panels warranted for twenty five years, we'll be in the market. That's kind of yeah. our that's our baseline. I think that's a pretty good return. 
you know, it's not as good as a business investing in some sort of thing, getting faster returns, but it's much better than what most people spend their money on. So yeah. if we can get someone that kind of like 10% return or 10 year payback, then, you know, we're, we're going to be in that market um, with that yeah. utility company. And that's kind of our threshold. Um, and that is improving, right? As rates, for, as you know, like all the cost of everything is going up. Cost of power is going up very quickly in a lot yeah. of markets. And, um, you know, we're hopeful to be able to help people minimize that and, and be able to save a bunch of money. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, to all those in the audience, you know, l- l- hit, hit us with your solar questions, leave comments down below, let us know what other topics to look into and discuss. Because like I said, there's, there's a whole lot of things, maybe a, a, a teaser to look at as, you know, solutions for shared housing, community solar type things. There's, there's so much to get into. Um, and I think that's more exciting than stressful. Um, so I appreciate your time, Marcus, um, sharing your knowledge and insight and uh, looking forward to more conversations in the future. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.